Welcome to the Three Thinkers Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, along with Chad and Erkan. And today we have a special guest, Marjan Musavi. Um, I first met Marjan when I was studying Farsi at Portland State University. And I'm going to uh, yield the floor and let, Ur- uh, let uh, Marjan tell us more about herself. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank you for having me, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm Marjan Musavi. Um, I am Iranian Canadian, based in Washington D.C. Um, I did my undergrad studies um, in Iran. Did my masters in English at University of Tehran. I moved to um, Canada around 2012, 13, um, as an immigrant. In Canada, I did my PhD in theater and performance studies at University of Toronto. Um, And um, in 2020, I moved to the US to teach at Roshan Institute for Persian Studies at University of Maryland. Right now, I'm a faculty member. I also um, do research about Iranian performing arts, Middle Eastern um, theater, I'm very much interested in exploring theater in other countries um, in the Middle East. Um, And um, I'm the founder of Digital Guide to Theater of the Middle East, dg2me.com. It's a website. Um, What else about me? I'm a mother of a six-year-old. She's actually a first grader on Monday. She goes to the first grade. Um, Yeah. Just, I'm open to your questions. So if I could jump in real quick. I, when I was reading one of, to me, dissonant theater in the Middle East is a really uh, interesting topic because uh, it combines censorship, people trying to make the most of their arts and find creative ways to fulfill their artistic and creative desires uh, while dealing with a lot of arbitrary rules and changing landscapes as to what's acceptable and what's not. And so I think I remember I, in one of the pieces you sent us, did, correct me if I'm wrong, did you win a prize as a, as a, a stage actor? And maybe you could yes. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Well, it was well, many years ago. Um, I performed a lead role in um, a theatrical, you could say, allegory based on uh, a literary allegory, a literary work that was uh, written, my my knowledge of Persian literature. Um, I think a classic Latin, let's, that's the safest word. Like, um, um, an allegorical poetry that was created um, many, many centuries ago in Iran. And that uh, play was performed was adapted based on that allegory, based on um, the fight between a group of cats and mice. And there was a storyteller who told that story. And I played the role of that narrator storyteller. And I was just nine years old. And for about 90 minutes on the stage, I was there narrating this poetic language. So it it was produced in my hometown, Mashhad. It's a city northeast of Iran. And uh, then we were invited to the National Theatre Festival in Tehran. We performed there. And it, it seems I impressed the jury because they defined a new category of award because, because I, was not an, I was not a grown up, an adult actor. Um, and I got the best actress. At that time, they used to give um, an honorary mention and also a, like a certificate and also a gold medal. Um, so I received that from President Khatami, the reformist president of Iran at that time was the Ministry of Culture, Minister of Culture. So that was the highlight of my childhood. And it really directed my you know, passion to, to our performing arts, theater and all that. Um, yeah, so from since then I, I, ha- I have been involved in theatrical performances in different capacities as a dramaturg, as a translator, as a, even yeah, a couple of times acting in short films, in long films, feature films. But then 
just to cut it short, there is a very competitive entrance exam if you want to go to state universities in Iran. And you have to really devote yourself at the end of the high school to that particular, to get prepared for that exam. So this means that acting and all those, you know, um, extracurricular activities go to the margin and you have to get ready for that exam. And um, since then, yeah, I've been, I mean, acting, especially acting, yeah, I guess, especially when I um, started university in Iran, I prefer to stay focused on my studying, my studies as an undergrad, which was in English. And I love drama, again, going back to the passion for drama and theater. Um, and um, yeah, so why, why, why I came here, just, yeah, so performing arts now, in especially in the last two decades in my life, uh, mostly has been the subject of my studies and research, yeah. Okay, uh, Chad, do you got do you have any kind of like thoughts on on what Marjan was just talking about? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just you talked about censorship in the Middle East and theater. Do you want me to go to that direction, or you have questions? You can you can definitely keep going. Um, sorry, or Chad, you want to ask your question first, and then. Well, so that, that I think that's I think that's an interesting question to ask. So maybe maybe we we talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I, in, in reading some of your pieces, um, it, it seems like, you know, you have some changes over the, over the past few years and decades in, you know, what kinds of censorship might be happening. I think that what's the term you use, vetting, vetting control, I think was one of the terms that I, that I saw you use <laughs> in, in one of your pieces. Um, and I guess a, a thing that occurs to me is, well, two, two questions. Um, are there subtle ways, do you think, that, that people, even though they know there are going to be these strictures, there are going to be these constraints, are there subtle ways that people can and do sort of act against them, or are they are they very concerned and just let's let's go straight about the the censorship, or do they find little ways to have subtle protest or subtle subversion in, in that process? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Iranian theater specifically talking about Iranian theater, but then cinema and performance art and music, you just name it. There are always ways to circumvent censorship because this censorship, as Kevin mentioned, is so attitudinal and it's so arbitrary. And it also changes in the course of time. So you would see a play that, for instance, was banned on the stage. It was on the stage and they it was banned right in the middle of the performance. Um, so it was performed for only two or three nights. But in, after four years, the uh, ministry invites the group to perform it again. They say, so there is always a change. So if you look at the history of productions of plays, you realize that, oh, there has been so much changes, both in the attitudes of the you know, authorities um, and also in but probably in the way the artists now are so much skilled at negotiating these boundaries, you know, instead of just sitting at home and say, okay, I don't make theater anymore. So part of my studies is definitely about these negotiations and uh, the push and pull between, you know, the artists, theater artists and the, um, the state authorities. There is... Um, and I am taking the Foucauldian lens when I talk about this. There's a there's a mutual constitutive, um, mutually constitutive relationship between artists and authorities. The artists conform to certain regulations, but at the same time, they really want to exert their own artistic agencies. So, um, and I'm not, of course, talking about those right wing propagandist artists. I'm talking about those artists who really want to work in Iran. They don't want to leave the country, but they. It is in their agenda to push the boundaries and to create a create a space for negotiations of values, not only with the state authorities but also with their own audiences. Because part of this, I mean, one source of censorship is, of course, the religious moral sensibilities of the audiences. You know, um, we talk about public morality. We talk about certain values of modesty that are not necessarily 
uh, regulated or mandated by Islamic narratives. It's there, it's been there for centuries, you know? And um, so there are definitely artists who are committed to, you know, creating open up spaces for, like dialogical spaces for negotiation between artists and the states and also artists and the audiences about all these values that must be questionable. If we want to create a change, all these values must be negotiated and you know reevaluated in the course of time. So this understanding is definitely um, um, very important and significant for the artist's vision. And um, they definitely have, I mean, I can go on and on talking about all those subtle, you know, strategies that art, theater artists have in terms of language, in terms of body movements, in terms of the narrative or thematic elements that are used. For instance, I know an artist who actually um, created his own system of codification for some um, swearing words, for instance. Um, and this artist uh, called Mohammad Yaqubi. He's now living in Toronto. He's a good friend of mine. And he is one of the te top 10 playwrights in today's Iran. Um, he has a performance, uh, a play called um, Drought and Lie. Um, two issues that are really, I mean, many, many people, but Iranians specifically these days are dealing with lie and, you know, um, drought, lack of water. And um, so he uses the word 25 instead of, I mean, he asked his actors, of course, to use the word 25 instead of some verbs like, excuse my language, to peace, to flirt. So as soon as the, like, in, for instance, the actor is saying that, uh, oh, I would like to, instead of flirt with women, he says, I would like to do 25 with women. And it's like, you know, this sort of defamiliarization of the, with the language and the Iranian audiences are so much skilled at, you know, reading between these lines. And I was present at the live performance of that performance in Tehran. They totally got the point. They totally got the point that the director actually is making fun of the censorship system. You know, okay, you don't want me to use this word to flare. I use the word 25. And interestingly, later on, he revealed to the media that 25 actually stands for the number of the law in the Iranian constitution that says censorship must not exist. So this is something in the same particular, th that particular performance, the, we have a couple, they want to embrace, they want to hug, but they're not allowed, of course. So at, at the, the exact time they want to look at each other, they turn to the audience and gaze at the audience. So this stillness, you know, is very much one of those subtle things or maybe you cannot, con you, you just don't consider it subtle because it was so obvious and we all laughed that, oh, okay, they want to embrace and they cannot, you know. And, um, or they went through stylized a slow motion of their, you know, body movements when they wanted to embrace each other. They just moved and they, they stopped. So, and it's, this is right in the middle of a realistic performance, a kitchen sink drama. It's not, we are not talking about abstract, you know, experimental performances that have stylized body movements. So, um, and then the other thing about subtle strategies, um, Iranian poetry, Persian poetry actually, is full of ambiguity. We don't have gender specification in Persian language to begin with, right? So you never know if the poet is talking about, is addressing his beloved, I say he's beloved because I know that particular poet, for instance, Sadi Shirazi. Um, when he's addressing his beloved, he's using the pronoun U, and we never knew, know if this U is a man or a woman. So gender fluidity, the ambiguity of meanings, the fact that in Persian culture, we don't have a clear boundary. We have, okay, we have something that happens in the appearance, you see it the facial value. But there's also, as we know that there's something going on under the surface, you know? All of that really influenced the aesthetics of stage performance. 
in um, uh, Iran. And as a Persian, I always look for, you know, hidden meanings, the meanings that are not told, they are subtly expressed. So yeah, just again, to cut it short, uh, there are always ways to circumvent. And the, the authorities, well, I would say that sometimes, well, you may consider them, they're not, they are dumb, they don't get, but I, this is not, I personally believe that they get it, but to what extent as a, as a sensor, you really want to cut and cut and cut. So they have also grown a sort of tolerance, especially when comparing uh, Iranian theater art um, to the, the one what we had in 1980s, the Iran-Iraq war, for instance, censorship was very much tighter at that time. Uh, but you know, in the 1990s, after the reformist era, and yeah, at the end of 1990s, beginning of 2000, we definitely see that the situation opens up um, and um, many banned discourses actually get to be uh, mentioned and negotiated in the media on TV. Uh, many topics that have been taboo, like prostitution, addiction, all that were uh, represented either on a stage or in the films, documentary films. We have a rapid growth in all those documentary films, especially by women artists. Um, and at the same time, we also have these underground you know, uh, movements for rock music, for um, theatrical performances, documentary making. Yeah. So I stop here. I Look forward to your yeah questions. Yeah, okay, I mean, time, go ahead. if I could, thank you. Yeah, if I could just jump in, yeah. Uh, the the um, it strikes me that I mean, quite aside from your um, your um, interest in 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 theatre and the attraction that you have to it, from like you mentioned the experience as a nine year old, and you you've been involved with theatrical performances since your childhood. I think quite apart from that. What I detected in your writing was a lot of a lot of political, sociological, cultural references, Foucault, you mentioned. And I think that must make it all the more fun and all the more interesting for you to write about, because there are so many layers here for you. You know, there's there's culture, there's psychology, there's there's sociology, there's politics, there's 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 feminism. There are so many layers for you to get involved in. And, Maybe you could say a little bit about that because I could detect that kind of language in your writing, actually. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for um, reading my work. Um, it is, it is um, definitely multi-layered, my research. And it goes back to the fact that I'm writing about a multi-layered shifting context, you know. Um, like many other countries, especially countries in the Middle East, Iran um, is really the, the context there is really multi-layered and shifting and that's very important we have new uh one of the very important things that i really wanted to do was to define a localized methodology that actually acknowledges these multi-layered you know narratives and uh, qualities that exist in that culture it's a very diverse culture we don't have it's not a culture that is so much um reduced to or limited to a master narrative of Islam. Islam is there and we have a, a, um, we have a spectrum of practices of Islam there. We have a, yeah, we have a spectrum of religiosity that is going on there. And their life directions, their practices of morality and religion are so diverse that you cannot say that there's only one way of practicing Shiism, for instance, in Iran. And um, then, so this is something that Iranian authorities would like to have, actually. Iranian authorities would like to propagate this ideal image of Muslim, Shia Muslim that lives in Iran. And that's why they invest money, they encourage artists to, let's produce this sort of art, this monolithic, you know, one ideal image of a Muslim in contemporary Iran. And this is exactly what the artists do not, you know, they don't want to do. They want to show this diversity of practices, uh, this shift that happens in the course of time to Iranian mentalities, to their understanding of democracy, you know, to their responses to everyday issues. 
So um, part of my research has been about this. For instance, Iran-Iraq war happened. That was a disastrous thing. But uh, for, for decades, even after war, the war was ended in 1988, authorities liked to call that war secret defense. So they saw this sacredness in that war, which is so much you know, challenged by the later artists and um, writers and performing art artists. They believe that we don't have just one reading of um, war. We don't have one motivation of war. The motivation was not always martyrdom or you know, resist a sacred resistance against um, the enemy. The people went to that war for various reasons and there were various responses to that. So challenging all those sacred values became actually uh, one of the biggest objectives of artists who wanted to give these counter narratives. And so to have, I mean, on the other hand, why I am so much interested in live performances in theater was that because it really allowed me to look at these aspects, you know, to the sociology of Iran. And, I, and by the way, I really, um, at least the saying in English, scratch the surface because I'm not an expert in sociology, I'm not an expert in psychology, um, but that's the beauty of, you know, theater, I mean, art, because if you want to analyze it and you want to go back, I mean, go delve into the way certain narratives are represented uh, and at the same time certain narratives are being challenged, then you have to then know a little bit of, you know, everything and write about them. Yeah. Does that I mean, answer your question? It does. And I was thinking also, because one of the one of the phrases that struck me in the piece on uh, desacralizing whispers was um, the docile body, right, which is a Foucauldian concept, which for the benefit of Chad, Kevin, and anyone else who's interested is listening, um, the, uh, the docile body is famously for Foucault is 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 encapsulated perfectly by the body of the soldier, right? The docile body who is the regimented body and acts under surveillance and, you know, this multi-layered surveillance system in the barracks and, 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 and so the prisoner, the soldier, this is the kind of the, the, um, the paradigmatic kind of um, docile body. But what was kind of interesting is that the, the actors were playing soldiers. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's that multi-layered thing again. So it's like, the, but the actors are kind of docile bodies because they're being, they're being watched. Like soldiers on a barracks would be watched in real life. The actors are being, they're, be, they're under surveillance. And so the actors are themselves kind of docile bodies in a way, aren't they? When, they, when they're kind of forced to conform in, in do you think I, am I am I reading too much into it, or is, is is that a kind of is that a good way of thinking? About um, it? Okay, let me um, give some share some of my thoughts, and then you tell me if I'm if we are on the same page. So I well, um, the actor. Okay, let me. I should see where to start. We have um, sacred defense theater, right? This theater could be categorized as propagandist theater, also, although propagandist theater, I would say, has its own continuum. We have absolutely propagandist, and then we have less, we have, you know, it's not that. We have diversity in actually practices of propaganda in sacred defense theater. And um, those who really wanted to um, represent the canonized narrative of sacred defense, they had their own group. The actors who were playing the role of those soldiers in the Iran-Iran, Iran-Iraq um, war front, many of them are true believers of both revolutionary ideals, you know, and the sacredness of war, the fact that they are um, just like those soldiers who were fighting to um, achieve that spiritual perfection, which is martyrdom, they are actually also agents of practicing that, you know, um, practicing in order to achieve that spiritual perfection, you know, just practicing because, because talking about different 
I mean, religious values and all those selves, you know, nafs, nafs amare, if you have Persian speakers among your audiences, they know what I'm talking about. Um, the greatest war for Muslims is not the actual physical war that you, you see outside. The greatest war is inside you when you have, when different levels of self or different states of self are actually at fight with each other. And as jihad, a true Muslim, right? so personal jihad. That yeah. Personal jihad. So exactly that jihad, the true jihad is one that you really want to face your anxieties and your weaknesses and. You have to practice and work toward that spiritual perfection, which is um, visiting God, for instance, right? The purity that you practice is should should be um, should be seen in all aspects of your everyday life. And as an actor, if you are a true believer, then why not playing the role of this soldier who's gonna be martyred, right? The other thing is that talking about the culture of martyrdom. Many of the um, many of the believers believe that uh, Muslim devotees they believe that martyrs never die, so they are they are big, the biggest the most important witnesses of this theatrical performance. They are among us and they're watching us. So talking about being watched, those actors they brought their faith to that performance and they performed it and many of them even talked about their spiritual journey that they had and they were really um, transformed in the course of performing. Um, but then we have these counter narrative theater, a theater that really wants to reveal the, the, the reality that happened, wants to show the absurdity and nastiness of war, right? Um, to those, they want, taking Foucauldian lens, they want their body and mentality and subjectivity be ruled in an alternative way. So they're looking for ways to be governed differently as Foucault says. Um, so this docile body, I mean, in my understanding in the counter narrative theater, the you know, counter war theater, counter sacred defense theater, they really want to um, show an alternative version of what happened in the war and uh, they resist, you know, they challenge all those narratives. They, they address your point. Yeah, so they resist, okay. they actually try to resist being in the docile body by engaging, yes, yes. In, this, engaging in this kind of counter hegemonic theater, basically. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, yeah. Wow, that's, that's like, I feel like we're getting into some really important, deep topics, but you guys did a great job of breaking it down for people. And um, I want to see if, uh, Chad, if you had some thoughts that you'd like to share. Well, so, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether, I, and, I, and I think probably does relate to this term that you use, desacralize, um, in, in some of your work. And, you know, I, I know the basic definition of that word, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that word or, or you know, you you kind of, kind of maybe already touched on it a bit. And in my my sense is that, that, that part of this is, as you've kind of been talking about, to make war a little bit more complex, more multifaceted, make the experiences of people in those wars more complex, more multifaceted. Their motivations are multifaceted. Absolutely. It's, you know, yes, there might be religion, there might be family, there might be nationalism or state, there might be personal reasons for being at war or personal reasons for wishing you weren't at war, but nonetheless you are. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that idea of desacralizing and, you know, and, and how that sort of plays out maybe on the stage a little bit with um, what that looks like for characters on stage. Thank you for the question. Um, so my understanding of desacralization, if I'm pronouncing correctly, actually came from one of the playwrights that I interviewed for my uh, doctoral dissertation, Ali Reza Naderi, who has written masterpieces of anti-war theater, you know, uh, plays. Um, Naderi told me, and in my articles, um, I mentioned him. Um, he, he told me that when you desacralize something, something, you actually make some aspects of that thing known to the public. When something is sacred, 
that thing is mostly unknown. It becomes sacred because it's unknown to people. Um, and for Nader, you're talking about his vision because he, for me, he's the best example. Um, he offered the best examples of this desacralization. He wanted to confront his audience. You know, he uses the word confrontation and encounter. And this confrontation for him means to revealing, you know, all those aspects that are unknown to the Iranian audience. And as you said very well, um, giving visibility, you know, making all these aspects, these layers visible to the audience was in that context, talking about early 1990s, was really a courageous and um, groundbreaking, you know, endeavor. And um, this is what he did. And um, yeah, sh making all these issues visible. In one of his plays, for instance, the play, the title of the play is The Whispers Behind the Front Line. Um, and he reveals all the, he, he has about seven or eight characters. I wrote that article about three years ago, so I don't remember the details. And each of these characters is coming from a different walk of life. You know, he shows this, they're coming, they, we have Jews, we have Armenians, we have Persians, Shias, you know, non-Shias, Sunnis. And um, he uses realistic setting. So the exact time and date in the 1980, I guess six or seven, 19, yeah, toward the end of war. Uh, so for him, this specific local references, specific characterization names, was very important. He was so much also influenced by his own experience as a soldier uh, in Iran Iraq war. So for him, um, sort of lifelike, photographic, you know, representation of that particular scene in Iran Iraq war became a, um, the most significant strategy to desacralize the image that we have from that war. You know, uh, in his other place. Uh, he wrote uh, a couple of social drama, dramas, and in those also he reads, he gives a um, very realistic, even naturalistic and lifelike depiction of everyday life. The everyday, you know, messiness of Muslims. We, we, we're not dealing with ideal Muslims who are practicing Islam in the perfect, the most perfect way. No, we see Islam and Muslims in, you know, in all their, with, with all their ambivalences, their doubts, their uncertainties. And that's the beauty of, of and I consider that desacralization, you know, because just making visible all these uncertainties and questions that you have in your everyday life. Okay, I, I had, I had like a two-pronged kind of question that could also uh, uh, lead us into kind of your journey from Iran and how you joined like what is some scholars say is the biggest national brain drain uh, in, in the world. And first, I remember when I started reading about Iran, because when I was younger, I always wanted to learn about other places. And I remember when I would read about Iran, what made Iran in the region really fascinating is how it's a reflection of its geography, as in, at one point, it was a center piece in the Silk Road. And Iran is actually, in the region, a multi-ethnic country. You have Azeris, you have Persians, you have Arabs, Kurds, and I think there's even an Armenian population. Um, but what's interesting is how, on one hand, Iran is under these strict sanctions, and there's all this internal censorship, but there's also a lot of especially in the creative communities, a lot of open-mindedness towards literature from other countries, mm -hmm. uh, music, Absolutely. art. And, and so like, how did that, how did all of that, especially the sanctions and um, your, your creative desires, how did that inspire your decision to immigrate abroad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking about brain drain, as an Iranian, I'm always sorry, I feel guilty that I benefited from the free education. Although getting that free education required a 
terrible competitive insurance exam. Still, I believe um, I got that free education and I left the country, right? Um, but in 2006 and seven, when I was in the US, I went back to Iran. I really wanted to pay back. I wanted to teach there, to work there. I wanted to serve my country. Um, with this huge experience that I had traveling, because before you were in the US, I also traveled to China and I te taught there. So I really thought that this multi, multi, a couple of countries, I traveled a couple of countries and I thought that I want to go back and uh, serve my country, that, to put it in simple words. But the, we had really had the problem of unemployment, especially for major, majors like the humanities, you know, graduates of humanities and art. Um, and um, I started teaching at university, private university, but still no job security. My husband had his own company. He's an engineer. Um, he, at, at first, four, it, 2017, for about four or five years, we he made good money, you know, through his company. There was sanctions. Iran, I guess, is the most sanctioned country since 19... 79, we have been sanctioned, but um, still in the 2010, 2000, okay, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, the economy was uh, in a way that he, he could run his own company, we could travel to Europe, you know, there was this interaction, interchange, between, exchange between European countries and Iran, um, but then more sanctions. And the Iranian currency is devalued. And we literally couldn't, he actually couldn't uh, continue um, doing the, um, the business with company with um, companies and factories in Iran simply because of this, you know, uh, inflation and this fluctuation in prices and all that. Um, and I wanted to do my PhD. At that time, there was no PhD of theater. There was a PhD in art studies general. I really specifically wanted to study theater. Um, and then 2009 happened, you know, that rigged election, the Green Movement. I don't know if you are aware of that. Um, the presidential election that many believed um, uh, the votes were stolen, literally. And the, we didn't expect that. I mean, I participated in that election and we were hoping for, you know, a reformist um, president to come, but then Ahmadinejad continued his second term. That was a, that was like a blow, like a, a big punch to our faces. We voted and we were, we were really hoping for a small change, not a revolutionary change. But even that one didn't happen. We were deprived of that minor, even small change small scale change. So I personally felt so frustrated. It was in 2009 that I said, I want to fill out the forms to immigrate to Canada. Um, and um, we started um, yeah, the immigration process, which also took longer than expected because of Syria. Our immigration files are are reviewed in Syria. We're supposed to be reviewed in Syria and then Syria Canadian embassy in Syria was closed and all that. So that was my journey. First of all, the passion to continue my studies, you know, um, and then my husband's work was very precarious because of the sanctions. And uh, yeah, Iranian currency was devalued. Can I just ask, uh, Marjan, um, so having moved to the West, to Canada, um, I mean, do you, with, like, we've talked about uh, these codes of Islamic decency and these kinds of uh, restrictions in Iranian theatre and so on. And I wonder, and cultural products generally, this kind of censorship. And I wonder, having moved to the West, um, do you recognise any parallels? How, how do you feel about cultural appropriation, woke politics? Um, do you recognize any parallels in the kinds of behavior that we're seeing now from Western people? Um, and how, how do you feel about this? Because um, a lot of people feel it's very dangerous and we're, you know, we, 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 we 
you know, we, we, we are contaminating the arts and things like this by, with identity politics and this kind of thing. So I wonder whether you could comment on that. How do you feel about that? Um, in terms of decency and modesty in arts, um, I was, I think the very first thing that I was surprised uh, to see in on Canadian stage was the conservative, you know, artists and audiences. And I kept um, hearing that, oh, this might offend this group of people, this might offend that group of people. So political correctness became a very important thing in my mind to the extent that I I prefer to shut up in many of the discussions that happened during my doctoral courses. You know, I had classmates who were members of um, minorities, gender minorities, and I didn't want to offend them. I didn't have that social capital to be, you know, okay, should I use this word? I should use this word or that word in order to avoid, you know, uh, being offensive. So I now that I'm looking at those first years doing my PhD, because as soon as I went to Canada, I started my master's and then immediately my PhD. Maybe that was too early for me. And, in the, you know, the field of humanities and art, there's so much discussion and there's so much uh, discussion around political correctness. And I was like, oh, oh, OK, I'm really scared. I don't want to offend my classmate who's a lesbian. So what if, if I say a sentence and that there's something that might offend her? And then I realized that on the stage also we have different sources of censorship. It's not that well, in Iran we have ideological or religious censorship, but in Canada there are, it's just maybe the vocabulary, the, the naming is different, but the limitations are there. So artists still are grappling with certain limitations. The most important one is economic problems that artists are facing. Um, the other thing is that as, a, as an immigrant, you often expect a more um, open-minded you know, society in the West to say that like abortion, right? I really, as a woman, one of my, one of my hopes and um, desires was that, okay, I'm going to a country that abortion is okay for women, or women have the right to divorce and all that. These, these were values that I was really looking for, but um, I see that many of them are, you know, yeah, many of my hopes in the West also were, um, um, Chattered, maybe that's their word. Um, so did I want to add? No, I think for now. Um, but yeah, freedom of speech. <laughs> It's really a complicated uh, thing, the line between respecting certain, you know, groups and at the same time having this freedom of speech and then at what cost having that freedom of speech. This is a big question for me. Yeah, yeah I think what you have in some Western contexts is instead of like censorship from the top or censorship from some government committee where a group of people just come together and depending on their mood or their, you know, what they had for breakfast. Uh, instead, I think in a lot of Western contexts, you have a lot of like self-censorship where people are putting censorship in place on their own without any sort of, uh, of top-down um, um, influence. And do you think that like, what, what are the, what, what sort of reception as a as a as a Middle Eastern woman? What type of treatment have you gotten? Because uh, I know you want to talk about the immigrant experience too that you've had. How have you been embraced or not embraced within theater communities in Canada and the U.S.? Do you feel like you've been embraced as a as a welcome member? Do you feel your voice is representative represented, or in the academic world as well, for that matter? Yeah, well, thank you for asking this question. I have been reading recently a book called Community of Rebellion, um, Surviving Academia as a Woman of Color. 
So it seems this this has been an issue in the US. That's why the book was published very re really recently in 2021, I guess the book was published. Um, generally speaking, I, you know, I felt encouraged and embraced. You no, know, it's not that I felt any prejudice. There is, okay, there's, so the one thing that I keep asking myself and I'm not sure about was the, the um, this access that as a second language speaker, I didn't have to certain regulations and privileges that my um, English native speaker cohort had because I was, as a newcomer, I don't know if you have experience, there's so much you want, you're really overwhelmed with this information, you know, and then you are, you have moved into a new culture. There's so much to digest. And then there are also certain regulations and privileges and awards and scholarships here and there um, that you want to get to know them. But I mean, I would say literally for the first three years, I, I was, it was not in my radar that I can apply to a scholarship or I can do this and that, the politics of being I mean, surviving in academia. Uh, so may, I, there are things that I'm not aware that I was not aware even you know, at that time. Um, but later on, I guess, well, things changed. When you stay in academia, you realize that, okay, there are certain ways that if you do this, you would be more successful. Uh, the other thing is that I really lost my network, you know, network of professors, friends. And um, when you are here as an immigrant, you don't have your prof in your undergrad who can write a good recommendation letter or who knows another professor in another department and can get a course for you to teach, you know. So these are all the things that as an immigrant you face on a daily basis in the job market. I... Well, I had 15 minutes for a Skype interview. That was the same time, the, the, the same duration that my native speaker friend had. So imagine the a native speaker's speed of you know, speaking is much faster, the amount of information uh, that they can give in that interview compared to what I want to you know, convey to my um, uh, interviewer. So, we talk about equity, but in practice in academia, there's a still a long way to go. And, but I should say that I'm coming from a country that is still is really grappling with all these things. So when I compare my teaching at university in Iran with here, I'm still happier here, of course, you know? It's just a matter of scale of expectation if you, because I'm in a developed country with all these, you know, this, level of knowledge about equity and all that, but still I see that, I see these instances of unfairness. Um, but when I compare to the situation that I had in Iran, I said, well, in Iran also there were prejudices. Tehranis had prejudice against people coming from small towns. Uh, not even talking about ethnicities, but just, oh, you came from non-Tehrani you know, city, and locality. So you are prejudiced, discriminated. Um, overall, I um, feel happy and I feel supported, but I know that um, the North American academia really um, is not fully prepared to have people like me. Um, the people still have their own you know, assumptions talking about Middle Eastern theater. They don't, literally, they believe in some, some academic departments, they believe that there is no theater or performing arts in the Middle East. How come a woman, a brown Muslim woman can teach that course, you know? Um, so um, that was the reason to add that actually I started my doctoral dissertation focusing on Iran and then started that website, Digital Archive of Theater of the Middle East. I also curated a, to exhibit on the theater of the Middle East, just to show, you know, that no, the theater exists. Yeah, of course, some factions, some branches of Islam were against representational art, you know, because they believe that God can only present a human being. So theater or performance art um, didn't exist in those 
areas, those regions of that Islam, and I would say extremist Islam is, you know, orthodox Islam is practiced. But in a country like Iran or in Egypt, in um, Lebanon, we have uh, had centuries of, you know, performative art. And um, people are not aware. I mean, I realized by the type of questions that I received in Toronto, they would ask, oh, you have, Iran has playwrights? I was like, what? Oh, yes, of course we do have playwrights. And uh, oh, how? And then they always reduce the Iranian theater to a theater that is, um, because of censorship, doesn't have any aesthetic value, you know? Um, or theater artists are always, you know, looking for, I don't know, ways to either um, just make religious theater, for instance. And it's no, this is not the way. We have all these sorts of theater theatrical performances, we have underground, we have even those performances that, um, you know, despite um, being challenged by sensorial interventions, get the license for public performance. I know we're getting close to our time. <laughs> I want to this is stop talking so much, but. Um, well, I, I was wondering, uh, I mean, we can, I, I don't know, um how much longer you have but we can go another uh 15 20 minutes if you want okay so so north american academia's response to middle eastern theater is that non-existent you don't see a course in the for instance in the course of history of theater you don't see middle east at all it just starts with greece and greek playwrights and all that greek festivals um, and um, so I thought that, okay, I want to design this course at the University of Toronto. I proposed the course as a PhD candidate, you can. I said, I want to teach a course on Middle Eastern theater and they allowed me. So I felt so much supported and welcomed. And I taught that course twice. But then I started sending email to, to about 20 theater departments in Canada, asking them, have you ever offered course on Middle Eastern theater and 95 persons said no. We might have one play or two plays in one of our courses, but we have never offered this course. So um, when I wanted to curate my photo exhibit, the, the department uh, gave me a very minimal fund, like $700 to, and I, and I found more, over uh, 100 photos from only only from productions in the 1950s and 60s in seven countries in the Middle East. And that, we're, we're not talking about contemporary, 1950s and 60s in and those countries, in Arab countries, in Turkey and in Iran, I found over 100 mm, photos and I wanted to scan them, but I had only $700. So <laughs> um, I use my personal, funding but they gave me the space to show you know I used the lobby of the um, the um, department to showcase the panels you know so but I left the University of Toronto and I'm sure they're not teaching me medicine theater anymore here at the University of Maryland also these courses do not exist they might offer some lessons or subjects in of the Eastern theater. Um, but um, reading um, plays that are produced in Syria and, you know, in Baghdad, in Damascus, in Egypt, you see that it's breathtaking. The repertoire is really diverse. It's not only adaptations. By the way, talking about adaptations, yes, Iranian art is so much um, influenced by translation and Western, especially European art. But many of these artists get the language and narrative and make it, you know, they add their own um, culture, they add their own. Chad? Um, I, was, I, was, I was going to say, so I, I, I'm guessing, I, I know a little bit about some poetry of the Middle East, mm -hmm. but I don't know much about drama of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that, you know, a lot of our audience probably don't even know the poetry of the Middle East, much less the playwriting, much less the drama. 
for, for people who are in that position, and it's probably a lot of people who might be watching this right now, what are one or two good places to start? You know, for people who are just like, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to get to know about this, but I want to know more about this. Okay, is there yeah. a specific book to start with? Is there a specific website or, you know, what, what are some good places to start if people are brand new to learning about this? Of course, I really appreciate this curiosity that um, your um, listeners or audiences have to knowing more about the Middle East. Um, um, reading about the Middle East, not from media, of course, never ever from media, but from the books that are published, from the articles, looking at the nuances that, you know, because nuances are not gained through just reading a quick, you know, Wikipedia page or reading, um, tweeting or reading the posts on social media. Um, one of the ways, of course, literature, reading the literature of the region shows really the depth. I'm sure your audiences all know who me, you know, the 12th century Persian poet, um, 12th, 13th century Persian poet, we call him Molana. And Rumi has been so much commodified in Western culture as just a spiritual leader. Nobody talks about his religion. We have this erasure of Islam in the case of Rumi. Uh, he is a Persian poet, um, very exotic, coming from past, and has so much richness and wealth in terms of spirituality. Um, even reading Rumi, I would say, because there are different translations of Rumi poetry, will show the kind of cosmopolitanism that existed in the culture of the Middle East, you know, the, the richness and the, all these questionings and doubts that human being, the fears, the anxieties that human beings, Western philosophers have been dealing with, they all have been, you know, mentioned in classical poetry. Um, in the Middle East. Um, many Eastern philosophers also dealt with those questions. Uh, it's just a matter of representation or the fact that they haven't been unfortunately translated, you know? Even talking about contemporary plays, for instance, um, they're not simply translated because, because of the language barrier. And I, this is one thing that I always tell uh, my friends living in the in the Middle East, please work on your English or French. Try to translate your works. Um, let people know that these works of art exist. I would say that reading literature and plays and watching films really help your audiences to get a nuanced understanding of what's going on in those countries. Um, yeah, uh, but in terms of a scholarship, look at this book. This is over 400 pages. The title of the book is Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practices, talking about how public spaces are actually reclaimed by artists these days in Iran. So yeah, this I got it. it it's been published uh, um, last month, I guess. It's a very new book. Only Amazon had it. The, the publisher actually told me, you have to wait for us to publish it, to uh, mail it to you. But I found it on Amazon. So reading such books really show that there is a vibrant artistic intellectual scene in those countries. And um, it's not that all those, we don't have this, I mean, let's forget about this binary of oppressing the state and a victim oppressed artist. Um, there have been always this kind of you know, dialogue between this, this and artists have been trying to push the boundaries and reclaim their own space, their own you know, voice. But right, as you, but as you say, you know, Marjan, I mean, artists are actively seeking those spaces, those little niches. And um, I, I was struck by a thought when I was reading Another, the other piece, uh, another one of your pieces, it was the performing and conforming piece. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 I was struck by, the, by a thought that it's like, if the, if, if the actors are 
if you've got these kind of Islamic values superimposed over the top of a performance and it's coming, it is coming from a top down kind of, we do have censorship bodies. Um, we've talked about docile bodies. We've all got, also got social, social bodies that do, you know, institutions that do these things to, um, and damage the arts and things, I think. And then, but the point I, w I was thinking, um, it kind of robs the it robs the theatrical production um it, it robs it of the kind of make-believe it robs it of that kind of fictional you know what's the point in having theater if it's not it's not acting then is it it's not drama is it if if if, if all that the if all that the people are doing on stage is what they could do and what they would be allowed to do under islamic kind of pretexts then what are we actually talking about? It's not drama, then, is it? It's just they're just conforming to the rules of of Islam as it is practiced or understood by the authorities, right? Well, I I don't look at this as an absolute following of those regulations, and it's I don't want to use the numbers, but um, this top to bottom, you know, imposing of values and beliefs should be a little bit, you know, leveraged or adjusted because many of these, we are talking about artists who are among, they come from their own. It's not the group of, we have, of course, theater compared to state TV or compared to other arts often is practiced by elite, elite group of people and the audiences are also, but now, of course, these days we see many less elite, I mean, non-elite people also going to uh, theater. But these artists come from the culture that is so much influenced by religion, public morality, Persian culture, um, literature, we're talking about literature. So many of them believe in the values of modesty or decency. It's not that they really want to uh, absolutely negate they are Muslims at the end of the day, right? Uh, and the, as I said, there there is a variety of way practicing or believing um, Islam and all these values. So it's not that 100% they do not believe in what they are practicing or enacting on the stage, you know? Um, let me give you this example. After the Islamic Revolution, of course, the censorship, we, before the Islamic Revolution of 1979, we had censorship. The Shah regime also had um, strict censorship. Um, and after the revolution, the same. Even three, 300 years ago, censorship was there, you know. Um, and, um, but something happened is that um, many of the liberal-minded women after revolution, especially in the 1980s, in urban areas, they were pushed aside because they didn't believe in hijab, in compulsory veiling. They didn't want to do veiled acting, you know, they didn't want to practice veiled acting, so they forgot about acting and they left the stage and left the countries. But at the same time, acting actually grasped, for women especially, grasped some sort of respect, social respect. Many of the traditional families who never allowed their girls to appear on the stage or in front of camera, they allowed their daughters and girls go and on the stage because these women were veiled actually. They covered their hair. Now, if they are playing the role of a wife, uh, th there's no kissing involved. There's no physical contact involved. And this wife also is covering her hair. So why not my daughter plays the role. Why not my daughter be an actor? So I want to say that many of the girls and women coming from traditional religious families actually got the opportunity to be socially active and artistically also active. Um, the kind of aesthetic, talking about make-believe, the kind of aesthetic that is staged, of course, is different. We never have realism to the sense that we have realism on British stage, on Tehran stage. Because uh, in the, on the British stage, if the, a couple is playing the role in the bed or in the bedroom, the woman never covers. In public, 
Well, that's more understandable. That's why, for instance, we see, in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the cinema of Abbas Kiarostami, the prominent Iranian film director, Abbas Kiarostami, he's an award winning. So he, sec he chose to shoot his films in the public because it's more understandable, more comprehensible to see a woman covering in the public. But inside home in private spaces, I never cover when um, a man, when you come to my home in Tehran, I never cover my hair because I don't believe in you know that. But when I go out, I cover. So imagine we want, I, as an actor, I want to play the role of a wife. And we have the scene that is happening in the bedroom or in the living room. And my husband's friend come. I don't believe, or even my husband, no, even my husband is there. And I cover my hair. As an actor, I cover my hair. But the scene, the realistic scene demands that this couple do not need to cover, right? But they are covering. That's, that's what I mean. It's realism. Kind of... It's really a different realism. This is but not if, a realism. What, if you want to, what I'm saying is, if it just becomes a repetition, like based on what I was reading from your piece, if I understand it correctly, well, something I thought about is if the if the theatre is just a repetition of everyday life, what you would see, and even like you said, in situations like that where uh, a female actor would be forced to wear the hijab because audience, there's an audience, well, then it's not make-believe, is it? It's not drama, right? I mean, if you can't step um, outside... What do you mean if, that it's if, not if, drama? If you, if they're not if they're not stepping inside a different realm and performing like it's not it's what is it then it's just it, it's they're, they're just living according to the rules of the society it's not like a kind of do you know what i mean it's, yeah um, but this is there is a kind of distancing effect i don't know if you're familiar with Bertolt break the german playwright who really believed in that uh, distancing effect the um the estrangement effect or distancing effect between the action that is happening and the reality of the audience. And also he believed that there must be a distance between the actor who is playing their role and the role they're playing. They shouldn't be immersed in their role psychologically. They shouldn't be immersed, um, contrary to Stanislavski's system of acting. Um, so there, I would say there are different degrees of realism, right? Or um, if an actor is actually playing or using a costume or using a stage prop that they do not believe in, but have to use, of course, they are conforming, right? They're conforming to those um, restrictive regulations. Um, but this, I, I don't call it not drama. It's just they are respecting out of necessity, or maybe out of their own belief, these regulations that exist. And I would say many of the countries also have their own stage regulations, you know, that uh, must be respected. When theater artists go to different countries to perform on international, you know, stages and different festivals, they have to respect certain regulations, right? Uh, I totally agree that the kind of realism that is going on there on the Iranian stage because of these um, veiled acting mm -hmm. and um, the props and costumes are different. Um, but also, as an Iranian audience, theater goer, that repetition of a scarf in the bedroom becomes something redundant for me in the process of meaning making, you know? It's there. The thing is the kind of the words and interactions that are going on. Um, and also we don't, so in terms of, for instance, practicing hijab on a stage, we have a variety of ways. We don't have only one form of, you know, black scarf or clad. Or, there are um, all sorts of headgears that um, actors, actresses actually use in order to cover their hair. There are even different kind of types of wigs that, and by the way, I can give a one hour lecture on I mean, the yeah, I, 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 of I, I, use I, of wig and the challenges that it has. Yeah. At some stage, it is allowed, some stages it's not allowed. It's really based I on the I mean, as you said, uh, sorry, and I understand like 
different places have different restrictions and different codes and and then also, like you said, you've got Brecht. I have heard of Brecht because my brother's an actor. You've got the Brecht school and then you've got the Stanislavski school, as you said. But you don't have that choice. That's not what's going on here. You don't have the choice between this realism and that realism. You just have one thing that you have to... And that's really the point I'm making, but I won't labour the point. I think mm. the chat wants to jump in. But sorry, I... I yeah. You know, at the end of the day, I know I totally... At the end of the day, these actors want to stay and work you know when I mean, many of them leave the country and for many of artists when they leave the country it means the end of their career right because as an actor then you don't you don't speak the language um, you cannot act on the stage um, and i don't want to go to that conversation that uh, in terms of diversity in casting how north america is really <laughs> lagging behind um, they they'd rather native speaker for instance play the role of an immigrant with an accent instead of hire a portuguese uh, immigrant to play the role of a portuguese right why choosing uh, an american actor and then asking them to change your accent so um yeah there is this obligation and the necessity of this is the rule of the game and you play, but you, you follow the rule of the game and if possible, you play with that rule, you know? This is the situation. I, I wanted to jump in and, and let Chad go and then uh, I, I got something I would like to add after Chad, that's cool. Okay, but my, mine might be a big one. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I, what, what I was going to ask Marjan is, what sort of your hopes? So we've we've talked about kind of where things are right now, where they've been historically, and and what some of the roots are of 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 theater in Iran and the rules and all those kinds of things. And um, what are sort of your hopes going forward? What would you like to see happen in Iranian theater in the next five, 10, 15 years, wow. and, and maybe for the larger society as well? What are where some of your hopes as well? My biggest hope is the removal of sanctions <laughs> and of course the change in the maybe more important than removal of action uh, sanction is the change in the attitude of the authorities you know because that country is, is really grappling with mismanagement corruption as well as sanctions sanction is one of the reasons that really is um, uh, affecting all aspects of life particularly then you have economic problem, you cannot produce art and culture, right? That's the first thing that is affected negatively. So um, my, my biggest hope is um, a little bit of reform. Um, we are not looking for revolutionary change anymore after the 1979. I, mean, I was not there. I was not born even in the 1979 revolution. I was born after that, but revolution is not the answer. The change must come from within, and it's only done through education and humanities, you know, by the country that is grappling with um, economic problems. How can we expect them to get better education if they have, you know, or to produce art and theater, you know? So theater artists are really, of course, are struggling with censorship. They're also struggling with lack of funding lack of venues to perform. Mm -hmm. um, so my strong hope is that um, both um, in terms of um, attitude and beliefs, there is some sort of openness uh, because the current government also is more conservative than the previous one. So you can expect what's going on there. Um, yeah, more openness to change and uh, less economic problems. I, I wanted to jump in here real quick. Um, and I wanted to ask, I wanted to reference something from your piece um, where you talked about, I read the piece on the FITR, the International Film, um, Theater Festival in mm -hmm. Iran. And one thing I thought about actually during Erkan's uh, question where he's you know, we're talking about kind of the, the definition of acting and relation and, and 
and uh, how you define acting under, you know, intense censorship is what I thought was interesting how uh, in the in the piece, there's a range of opinions with with the international groups. Some were like, this was uh, uh, like, I couldn't believe the censorship. I can't believe we had to, you know, change our play an hour before we took the stage. Others were like, it was the the cultural connections were worth the price. They were worth the censorship. And then even within the, the Iranian context, you had some play, some, some theater, some actors saying, well, you know, hey, we already changed the play when we go outside of Tehran. If we go to southern Iran, we've got to change it. If we go to smaller towns, we have to change it. So we're just working within that. And and so I guess what what I to me, the question I wanted to pose, and maybe it's too big, but like to you, like if you were preparing to play for the international I- Iranian film, oh, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the acronym stands for. I forgot, but. The, international theater, Fajr yeah. uh, theater festival. Right. If you were preparing to play for that festival, is there a level of, of critique or censorship or that you, that would reach a certain point where you would just say, all right, I'm not doing it. I'm not, yeah. Uh, I'm not doing this play. Is there, is there like, for you, how much constraints are are you willing? If you're a a, a theater director, how many how much restraint are you willing to tolerate? That's really a question for theater practitioners. But uh, many of them decided not to make theater anymore. So if you look at the career of many playwrights in Iran, you see that they were active for about 10, 15 years. And then they got tired, you know, simply tired, or they just thought prefer to make films or stay home or never publish, never uh, direct any play for the stage. But you would see some people that, okay, I believe that they continue to work despite censorship because they always find ways, they find leeways, you know, to circumvent. Um, so it really depends on the artist's vision and commitment if they want to continue to what extent they have this tolerance you know to this much change or no but i just wanted to say that performing at the festival in the festival artists have a little bit more freedom than performing for about 40 nights on tehran stage you know so the levels of censorship varies really international festivals often uh, are more tolerant they um, supervision committee there because there are you know there's international press there there are international artists who are visiting so we, we see some performances that are that are allowed on international theater festival but then later on even international film festival uh, i have heard that let's watch this particular film at the festival it has less censored scenes because when for public screening that film uh, is caught more or there are scenes, certain scenes that are shown on the festival, but then after that, you will not be able to watch the film fully. Um, talking about that particular experience of you know doing research, I was really, really amazed by the attitude of European artists. I felt that I don't want to name any particular country, but one of the groups, they loved the experience when they had the interview, when they were interviewed by Iranian press, they loved the experience. They said, we are totally okay. We asked our actresses to cover, even our actor wore a shirt. We were totally fine. We will come back. And then they never mentioned on their website that they were on there because there's always a page where they have toured, you know? They never mentioned on their website that they have been to Iran. The other thing is that, yeah, they said something in the Iranian press and then out to their own country, the press in their own country, they said something else. And I was really surprised about that. The biggest reason that my supervisor and my professors in Canada, I was when I was doing that research, I was in Toronto. They, gave, they told me because um, Iranian um, Ministry of Culture or the organizers of the festival, they give so much money to these European artists to bring their show. 
um, to stage, for instance, twice on Tehran. So they, if they stage, they perform twice in Tehran, they give this amount of money that is really equal to the whole season of the money that they want to make in their own country. So when I saw that, I said, okay, the censorship is not something that I, as a researcher, must really make fuss about because artists themselves, because of, again, economic problems are okay to change their, you know, work. One reason was this financial gain. The other was that they genuinely wanted to reach a different audience. So I, I believe them and I respect that, you know, that they really wanted to experience a non-Western audience, you know? But at the same time, the financial gain was so much for them that they really accepted to go. And that changed my attitude to our censorship. I said, okay, this is the artist, this is the authority, this is this is artist's opinion, this is authority's opinion. And as a researcher, you know, maybe I should also have a more nuanced, I don't know, uh, less black and white attitude towards censorship. You know? I, I I don't know if you guys mind. I I wanted to wrap up with one last question, if that's okay. Is that okay sure. with you guys? That's Is that fine. okay, Marjan? Um, okay. Uh, one thing I used to read about uh, some of the books I read about Iran is that basically after the revolution, a lot of Iranians just took the things they did outdoors and took them indoors to their homes, mm -hmm. to the privacy of their homes. And I was wondering, like, are there sometimes in Iran, like, let's say, home stage performances? Are there, are there where, where people maybe put their guard down a little bit and they're around trusted people and maybe they, they yeah. try out some of these performances? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, well, Talking about the complexity of Iranian life, we have a different life outdoor and indoor. You know, um, in private, um, we have private uh, music classes, private acting classes, parties. The parties that I had in Tehran were so actually very, yeah. We, I mean, you, you see everything on those underground parties in Tehran. Um, watch the film Te my tehran for sale you with it's available on youtube with english subtitles you could uh, see those parties in tehran um so we have definitely underground performances uh, interestingly one of the very professional theater practitioners who was banned from staging theater on um, official stage he for uh, Several years, he decided to stage his performances for a um, selected group of audiences. They used um, social media or even just um, text messaging, you know, and um, Telegram, these platforms in order to sell tickets or they, they, they actually sold tickets, pay what you can at the door. And the art, the audience would come in an apartment or in a big house and they, they would perform their show minimally staged, you know, with a very minimal stage design. And um, they perform for like every night for 30, you know, audiences. So they didn't have to go through the, you know, that vetting system of reading the script. And then because you send a script for permission, the next stage is you do the rehearsals with the group and then members of the committee come and watch the run through the performance and then they give the license for public performances. So several artists who wanted, didn't want to go to that process, they're of course staged. Talking about, again, I mean, this book is a very good example. They, it has more than hundred, over hundred, uh, hundreds of um, examples of performance art, the galleries, you know, and um, gorilla performances and the public spaces that are suddenly taken by the artists, they do something and they're gone. So we have these unofficial performances. Um, yeah. This, this has been so informative. Rock, sorry, oh. rock concerts, they're rock always concert. underground. Wow. Watch the documentary, um, nobody knows about Persian cats. And it's literally introduced to some of those, uh, but they are very short, ephemeral talking about, you know, they're not, 
there for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, all of I, I think there's even a significant are... metal scene in, in Iran, a metal music scene in Iran from what I understand. So, because I'm kind of a metal guy. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, unfortunately, but uh, it's shortly. It's not a long term practice. Um, I think this has been a, a great and informative podcast. I mean, I think people have learned a lot and I actually feel like we delve deep um, into one subject and I feel like we could have another podcast on underground theater. I mean, really. So um, I want to thank you for coming on and talking to us and teaching us so much about Iranian dissident theater and about the uh, you know, immigrant experience that you've had in Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I would talk about those artists as far as I'm, I'm not putting their life and career at right, risk. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, as a researcher, as a researcher, I always, I mean, I ask myself who benefits from this research. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, ethics, yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on with us. Thank you, Marjan. Thank you. I really you appreciate much. your questions. And it was a treat. Yeah. Do you okay. have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Or any okay. websites you'd like to tell us about related um, to your research or um, other things that other resources people could uh, could look into? Yeah, I can I can actually send you a couple of websites, podcasts and and a couple of books. And then um, you can also share my email address to your audiences. If they want to get in touch with me, I would be glad. Yeah. I would love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great Thanks, time. Maja. Thank you so much. Bye.